thank you for joining us. I'm Vin Sylvia, Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications at Sylvia Group, here to welcome you to today's webinar on Medicare Open Enrollment for 2018. I'll start by introducing today's presenter, Sylvia Group Vice President of Employee Benefits, Julia Jennings. Julie has more than 30 years experience as a health insurance professional, and she's nationally recognized not only for her expertise, but also for her service initiatives to improve the health insurance market. She's a recipient of the National Association of Health Underwriters' Most Prestigious Honor, the Distinguished Service Award for her lifetime commitment <coughs> excuse me, to her profession and her community. It's my pleasure to introduce Julie Jennings. Thanks, Ben, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of this beautiful October morning to join us. And um, as a preface to the, um, this morning's webinar, I just want to mention that today's webinar is being presented as a general overview of Medicare. And in this webinar, we're going to cover the parts of Medicare, how you become eligible, when you can enroll, and what coverage options you'll have. Um, but this is not a sales presentation and we will not be covering any specific carriers or products in the webinar. If you do have questions about your Medicare eligibility after the webinar, or if you'd like to meet with us to discuss um, specific Medicare products, open enrollment, Medicare Advantage, Part D plans, um, whatever, please be sure to let us know. With that, let's get right into the meat of the, um, the program. So Medicare is the closest thing we have to national health insurance in the United States. In fact, Medicare currently provides health insurance to over 57 million United States citizens. That's approximately one in every six Americans. Generally, to be eligible for Medicare, you must be a US citizen or you must be a legal resident who is in the United States living for at least five consecutive years. Medicare is the primary insurance for um, older Americans, age 65 or older, but also covers certain disabled persons. So um, in addition to the age uh, eligibility, you could become eligible for Medicare due to a disability in which you are receiving Social Security disability insurance benefits um, for 24 months or more. If you have a diagnosis of Lou Gehrig's disease um, or ALS, or at any um, age, if you are diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, which is a permanent kidney failure requiring you to either be on uh, daily dialysis or requiring a kidney transplant. So while Medicare is the health insurance for uh, primarily for older persons, it should not be confused with Medicaid, which is the health insurance for people without enough financial resources or income. There are some people who may qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. That's not something we'll dis discuss today, but I um, just want to make sure that you have a comfortable level with the vocabulary. So there are a few federal agencies who are involved in Medicare. The Social Security Administration is responsible for enrolling people, and that's where you will go initially to uh, apply for Medicare and they're the ones that will determine what premiums you have to pay, um, which we'll, we'll get into special circumstances for premiums. They'll also handle if you lose your Medicare card, that's who you contact to get a replacement card. If uh, you are a railroad employee and you're ret retiring from the railroad, then you would deal with the Railroad Retirement Board instead of Social Security Administration. Um, everything else ends up falling under the, um, the direction of the CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They're the ones who actually administer the Medicare program. Um, and one final uh, comment, if you retire from federal service, you actually would end up going through the OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, um, if you have any questions about premiums. So those are the uh, Medicare agencies on a federal basis that you'll be working with. There are four parts to Medicare, um, and that's because Medicare has evolved over time. So the original Medicare, which is Parts A and B, were passed in 1965 under um, President Johnson, and since they were the first, we do refer to them as the original. And Part A is the hospitalization insurance, and Part B is the medical insurance. So those are the two parts of original. 
just for now, I'm going to skip Part C and move on to Part D, which is the Medicare Prescription Drug Plan. Um, this is the plan that helps pay for outpatient prescription drugs, and it's the most recent coverage that was enacted into Medicare by law in 2006 under what's known as the Medicare Modernization Act. And at that time, um, it became a requirement for all people on Medicare to have prescription coverage. So going back to Part C, or, um, what's commonly known as Medicare Advantage, it's um, it's a compilation of the coverage under A, B, and D. So original Medicare is managed by the federal government, but Medicare Advantage plans are actually managed by private insurance companies that are approved and uh, certified through Medicare. So they must provide coverage for everything that you would receive coverage for under original Medicare. They also include additional um, services that are not covered by Medicare, such as eye exams, hearing aids, or gym memberships. Most Medicare Advantage plans also um, have the Part D prescription coverage incorporated into their plan. So you have original Medicare, which is A and B, you have Medicare drug plan, Part D, or you could have sort of exchange all those uh, for one coverage under Medicare Advantage. Drilling down to what um, the different components are, let's first look at Part A, hospital insurance. And we call it hospital insurance, although it covers other inpatient coverage, such as um, skilled rehabilitation services, psychiatric services, and skilled nursing facility. It also covers some services outside of hospitals, such as home health care and hospice care. Some of your inpatient care, such as doctor's visits, will be covered under Part B insurance instead of Part A, even though you are inpatient. What's not covered under Part A insurance is uh, private duty nursing, private room unless it's medically necessary, and then some ancillary services such as a telephone uh, or television if uh, there's a separate charge for your room, and other personal care items like razors or those nice little grippy slipper socks that they give you. What exactly are your Part A Medicare costs? Um, I want to first say that this is what you pay in 2018, but you'll notice that we've uh, notated here that all the figures that we're showing are 2017 figures. And that's actually tr true throughout our presentation today because the federal government has not released the 2018 figures yet. Although I'm assuming it's going to be any day now, and I'm sorry that we don't actually have them yet. So every year they do look at these figures, they're usually adjusted by inflation. Um, but let's talk about Medicare Part A premium. Most people actually don't pay for Medicare Part A, and that's because you've been contributing to Medicare through payroll taxes uh, throughout your working years. So if you and your spouse have 40 quarters of Medicare wages, your Part A premium is generally going to be free. If you haven't reached the 40, but you have um, at least 30 quarters, then you would have to pay for Medicare Part A, and the standard premium in 2017 was $227 a month. If you have less than 30 quarters, um, you're actually going to have to pay up to $413 per month for Medicare Part A. And again, that's not if you've um, put your quarters in, you've you know pretty much been a, a working employee throughout your your career and you're coming up to 65, you're going to have Part A for free. Part A does have deductibles and co-payments, and these are adjusted each year for inflation. So they didn't start out this high, but they're definitely creeping up there. In 2017, the deductible for Part A inpatient hospital stays was $1,316. And if you, whether you go into the hospital as an inpatient for one day or 20 days or 60 days, um, you're responsible for that initial $1,316 co um, deductible. After that, if you're in the hospital longer than 60 days, you will then have a daily co-payment for each day that you're in the hospital beyond that 60 days. And the co-payments are quite hefty, as you can see, in 2017. The uh, co-payment for day 61 through 90 is $329 a day. And then after day 90, it would be $658 per day. Once you've exceeded 150 days of hospitalization, your Part A benefit is actually exhausted. 
there is no out-of-pocket maximum in original Medicare, which means that you never have to, you will never stop paying as long as you're in that inpatient situation, you're going to be responsible for making that copayment no matter how high um, it accumulates to. As we said, Part A does cover, um, in addition to hospital stays, also covers rehab and skilled nursing facilities, but there are some specific conditions to meet in a skilled nursing facility. Your uh, doctor must certify that your condition requires daily skilled nursing care or skilled rehabilitation services, which can only be provided in a skilled nursing facility setting. Um, Part A does not cover custodial or long-term care when it's the only type of care that you're receiving in a facility. We generally define custodial care as that care which um, helps you with usual daily activities, such as getting in and out of bed, eating, bathing, dressing, and using the bathroom. It can also include care that most people are able to do themselves, um, things like using eye drops or uh, oxygen or taking care of your um, colostomy bag. Most of us have been have seen or experienced situations with our loved ones where skilled care is initially needed and it's provided for a short period of time. Let's say someone has a, um, a stroke and gets hospitalized, but it comes to a point where the patient is no longer certified to need skilled care and there yet is still a great need for custodial care that can last for several months or even years. And um, that it's important to note that that is not something that your Medicare plan covers. If you need insurance to cover situations like that, you need to be considering long-term care insurance. So um, just to keep in mind what's not covered in the skilled nursing facility, does not cover um, custodial care, has to be for skilled care. Um, in order for a skilled nursing facility to be covered, it has to be preceded by a hospital inpatient stay of at least three days. Medicare is very specific. They count the day that you're admitted, but they don't count the day that you're discharged. And there are times that you could be staying overnight in a hospital, but it doesn't guarantee or mean that you're considered an inpatient. They could have you in what's called observation status, in which case, um, if you're in the hospital, you're in observation status, even if it's for three days, and then you go into a skilled nursing facility because you have not been an inpatient, um, you may not have skilled nursing care. So there's uh, definitely some, you know, glitches there that you have to be careful of uh, in, in Medicare. The care has to be provided in, um, for the, the reason that you were in the hospital initially or a condition that arises um, as a result of your care in the nursing facility, let's say that you develop, you know, pneumonia or something after hospitalization and you have to be um, in a Medicare-approved facility. <clears throat> Skilled nursing facility um, is covered in full for the first 20 days after your hospitalization. Remember that you've already paid that $1,316 for hospitalization. So the first 20 days in a skilled nursing facility, no copayment. If it goes over 20 days, then you're going to be responsible for a daily copayment in skilled nursing facility. The amount in 2017 was $164.50 per day, and again, this will be adjusted for 2018. Your skilled nursing facility benefit does get exhausted after 100 days, so even if the skilled need continues um, and it doesn't you know, degrade down to a custodial need, your benefit is going to be exhausted after 100 days. I mentioned that Part A also covers home health care services, and home health uh, includes uh, services, obviously, in your home that could include uh, skilled nursing care, physical therapist, speech uh, and language pathology, occupational therapy. A lot of times the occupational therapist will come and um, help you do things like, you know, take your shower or, um, you know, change bandages or, you know, pr um, prepare meals, et cetera. But um, it does not, home health services do not, uh, cover like meal preparation or homemaker services or personal care. So it's only in when it's as part of that skilled care 
will they allow for those services to be covered? Also, it uh, doesn't cover for any 24-hour daycare in your home. Moving on to Part B, um, Part B covers the medically necessary outpatient services and supplies, including your um, doctor's visits. And as I had mentioned before, that would be you know in or out of the hospital. Um, outpatient medical and, sur and surgical services. So if you need stitches or um, if you need x-rays, that would be an example of outpatient medical. Clinical lab tests such as blood work or urinalysis and some screening tests. Durable medical equipment like walkers or um, special beds or crutches are all considered durable medical equipment. Diabetic testing supplies, so your glucometers or um, whatever you use for, for monitoring your blood sugar levels. Preventative services, and um, there are certain times when home health care is going to be covered under Part B. So in a situation where home health care is not preceded by a hospitalization, then, um, you know, let's say that you had an, an accident, you were treated in the emergency room, you went home, and then you needed home health care, that would be covered under your Part B. And um, also there are some home health services that are covered once your home health benefit under Part A is exhausted. So um, that's what Part B covers. And um, what it costs is, uh, you know, another issue. First of all, Part B insurance has an annual deductible and a 20% cost sharing under it. So you are responsible for meeting the, um, the calendar year deductible and then 20% of all of your Part B covered expenses. And we'll talk about how to get coverage for the, that part that's not covered in a few minutes. In 2017, the standard monthly um, premium cost for Part B, so remember you don't pay for Part A, but you do have to pay for Part B, in most cases, um, is the premium is $134 for anyone who was newly signing up for Medicare in 2017 or for anyone who had Medicare but is not currently receiving Social Security benefits. Um, most people who get Social Security benefits are actually paying, excuse me, paying less than this. Um, that's because um, the Part B premium has increased more than the cost of living has increased the benefits and for Social Security. And there's actually a protection within the law um, that doesn't allow Social Security beneficiaries to have to pay more for their insurance that would result in a, decre a decrease in their um, monthly Social Security income benefits. Also to note that if you have higher incomes and you're in Part B insurance, you are going to have to pay an additional income-based premium for your Part B insurance and also for your prescription drug coverage. Here's a chart that shows you the income-related monthly adjusted amount, um, or short and short known as IRMA. So under IRMA, if you earn more than, or your tax return shows that you earned more than $85,000 if you're filing as a, an individual, or $170,000 if you're filing as a married and joint uh, filing return, then you are going to have to pay an additional amount for your Part B insurance. We don't have the, the 2018 premium, so on this chart you'll see that that's blank, but the 2017 premiums are included. So again, the first the first uh, level of income, if you are at that income or below, you're just going to pay the standard $134 per month. But as your income goes up, you will have a higher amount to pay for that same Part B coverage, and it's all based on income. In 2018, they're actually adding another income level to that um, category to the chart. So if you look down, you'll see that um, people who are earning $107,000 to $133,000 on a single basis have the same premium in 2017 as those that are earning up to $160,000. But in 2018, they're going to be split. So um, if you were, if you're already in the system, if you're already paying for Part B and you are subject to the surcharge um, under IRMA, then you really want to look at look at your 2016 tax return, 
look at the bottom number on the first page, that's your modified adjusted gross income, and see where that puts you on this chart. Look at what you um, paid or what you would have paid in 2017 and know that in 2018 is going to be something more than that. That's all that I can tell you right now. Um, we haven't seen the, the figures released. So under Part B, there are some cost considerations. Um, the premiums can change every year. And obviously, as long as you postpone your receiving your Social Security, you are subject to those premium increase um, changes. And um, you also have, we talked about paying the income uh, panel, uh, the income surcharge, but if you don't sign up for Part B when you're initially eligible, then there is also a late enrollment penalty for Part B. It's accumulated on an annual basis, so you're going to pay 10% more than the standard premium for each full 12-month period that you could have been in Part B but didn't sign up for it. Most people don't willingly do this. Usually what happens is they find out that they're subject to this penalty because they didn't know or didn't do something on a timely basis when they should have. So part of what we try to do with our clients is prepare as you're approaching 65 or you're approaching retirement to just really know what your enrollment uh, opportunities are and what under what circumstances you can postpone or what circumstances you need to sign up. So when can you enroll in Medicare? We've talked about that age is a trigger. So when you turn 65, you can enroll in Medicare. We also talked about Social Security disability, that if you're disabled for 24 months, um, then that entitles you to enroll in Medicare if you um, are receiving Social Security or retirement benefits, that triggers Social Security. Um, we've talked about end-stage renal disease. And what we still need to talk about um, going forward is is um, how your current employment and your health insurance that you might have through your employer affects your eligibility and timing for enrollment. So there's something called automatic enrollment, and that's going to happen for people who are already receiving Social Security or retirement benefits before age 65. So let's just say as a really easy example, I decide to retire, I'm 64 years old, and um, and I want to take my Social Security early. So I retire at 64, I sign up for Social Security, and um, this, the Social Security Administration is going to see, I'm in the system, they're going to see my birthday, my 65th birthday coming up, and they're going to automatically enroll me in both Part A and Part B without my having to do anything. It's called automatic enrollment. They're going to send an initial enrollment package to my home. Um, it's going to include my Medicare card and other pertinent information about the plan. And they're going to send it to me about three months before I turn 65. Um, if I happen to be a younger person on, let's say, uh, someone who was on disability, had gotten disability at the age of uh, 58 and has been receiving Social Security benefits, then once that uh, 24 months comes up, that's going to trigger eligibility under Medicare. Again, the Social Security knows about me and they're going to send a package about three months before that 24 months of uh, disability benefits ends and automatically enroll. If that, ha if that is a situation that applies to you and you don't want uh, your Part B coverage because you have other coverage or whatever, then you can fill out the back of the Medicare card and send it back and say, don't give me Part B. I don't want to start paying for it yet. Um, but with most baby boomers, um, now having to wait until age 66 to qualify for full Social Security benefits, there's fewer uh, chances that you're going to be automatically enrolled in Medicare. Uh, most baby boomers are either working or if you're retired, you're postponing your Social Security until you can get a larger benefit at age 66 later. So if you're not getting benefits under Social Security or, again, under railroad retirement, then you have to sign up for Medicare. It's not automatic. This is how you do it. If, you're not, if you aren't getting Social Security, 
um, for at least four months bef before you turn 65, then you're going to need to sign up for Part A, even though it may be free for you, and you're going to need to sign up for Part B. You can do that by contacting Social Security, either by going to their website, um, by calling the 800 number, and good luck with that because a lot of times you can be on hold for a long time, and uh, or by making an appointment to visit your local Social Security office. And um, note that you do not need to be retired to get Medicare, okay? Um, so even if you're working at age 65, make sure that you know what you need to do when you turn 65. And that's where we now lead into talking about the Medicare enrollment periods. There are different times that you can sign up for Medicare, and in the next few slides, we're going to cover these time periods. One is called your initial enrollment period, or your IEP. Another is the annual enrollment period, or the OEP. Um, another is the special enrollment period, SEP, and then there's a general enrollment period. So your very first opportunity to enroll in Medicare is um, based on age is what's called your initial enrollment period. And that lasts for seven months. So they give you three months up front, three months before the month in which you turn 65, the month in which you do turn 65, and then three months after. That entire seven month period is considered an initial enrollment period. And if you sign up for your Medicare um, Part A during this period and Part B, then you will um, not have to. You will not be considered a late enrollee. And you will not have a penalty. Most people, we recommend that you actually, um, if you're going to go on to Medicare, that you look three months prior to your birthday and that you sign up the for you know as as soon as possible during that time period. So as long as you sign up during those those three months prior to the month in which you turn 65, your coverage is going to start on the first of the month in which you turn 65. doesn't matter if your birthday is November 25th, your coverage starts on November 1st. And then if you happen to miss those three months prior to um, your month of birth, then you go into the, the remaining part of your initial enrollment where your coverage is not going to start on the first of the month that you turn 65, but the month after. So if I my birthday again is November 25th, I don't think of signing up for Medicare until November 10th. They're going to approve me for December 1st, not for November 1st. And similarly, if you wait a couple more months, then it could get pushed out as much as three months. So we are coming up to what's known as the annual open enrollment period. And for those of you who have already enrolled in Medicare and um, you have coverage under a Medicare Advantage plan, a prescription drug plan, a supplemental health plan, you're coming up to a very exciting time. This is the annual uh, open enrollment period. It starts on this Sunday, October 15th, and it lasts through uh, December 7th. Any decision that you make to change your insurance or to um, purchase, you know, to, to enroll for a new plan is going to take effect as of January 1st, 2018. So that's why you're starting to see a lot of advertisements on TV or in your local newspaper. Um, you may be getting invitations to Medicare Advantage uh, marketing events in local libraries or at your Council of Aging or even at your place of worship. So there's a lot of like advertising coming at you right now to say, hey, we have a plan that you might like, and if you want to make any changes to your plan, this is the time to do it. Um, just want to remind you that the Soviet Group is your trusted insurance advisor. We're certified to offer several of the Medicare Advantage plans, um, the Part D plans, supplemental plans, also dental, vision, annuities, long-term care, final expense, you name it. Our focus is in, on identifying and helping our clients find the best insurance options to cover their whatever is keeping them you know, up at night, whatever you're concerned about. Not only at open enrollment, but we're here all year long um, and in the years ahead to help you plan for your health care needs and make um, decisions that fit your personal needs and situations. 
So I know that some of you on the call today are still working. Yay. And, um, and you plan to keep working after the age of 65. So if you or your spouse are still working and you're over the age of 65 and you're not receiving Social Security, chances are you did not enroll for Part A or B during your initial enrollment period, and that's fine um, under certain circumstances. If you are approaching age 65, you might not be sure whether you need to sign up for Medicare now at, or at age 65. So this is very important for many people to, um, to understand how the special enrollment period works. Basically, you can postpone enrolling during your initial enrollment period. So in other words, you can postpone enrolling when you turn 65, um, and you can enroll during a special enrollment period if you've had um, suitable insurance during that time period. The special enrollment period allows you to, um, to sign up without any late enrollment penalty, but the conditions are, are specific and they're limited. So to be eligible for a special enrollment period, you must have group health coverage based on what's known as active current employment for either yourself or your spouse for the entire time that you were eligible to enroll in Part B. So you know that your, your initial enrollment period was triggered by age 65, but you, you choose to continue working and staying on your employer health plan, and now you're coming up to age 66 or 67, and you're ready to, um, to make the break to go down to part-time or to totally go into retirement mode, and, and you're going to, at that time, terminate your group health plan. You're no longer going to be eligible um, or considered under active current employment. And that's what's going to trigger the special enrollment. You have eight months to sign up for Part B, for Part A and or Part B, that starts on um, the month after your employment or your coverage ends. And so, this is another opportunity. If you didn't do the initial enrollment period, here's a chance that you can go and sign up for Medicare under a special enrollment and not have any penalties. However, um, we do run into situations where people who are terminating from their employer health plan end up selecting the COBRA coverage, not realizing that COBRA is not considered active current employment coverage. And this could jeopardize your status or your eligibility under a special enrollment period and could also trigger a late enrollment penalty. So you want to make sure um, that you know that COBRA, retiree coverage, workers' comp, or even VA coverage, none of those is considered active current employment and doesn't entitle you to this Medicare special enrollment period. So what happens if you haven't signed up during your initial enrollment or during a special enrollment period? Um, you cannot get involved in the open enrollment period because you're not eligible. You have to come in during what's known as a general enrollment period. This is sort of like the last resort. This is the only way that someone who like sort of misses out on their initial opportunity to get insurance, this is the only way that they can enroll in the future. Um, unless, of course, you go back to work full time, you get onto a group health plan, um, and then you terminate from that, that might be a way that you could uh, um, trigger the, the special enrollment. But in general, if you didn't do it then uh, at initial enrollment, then you have to wait for general enrollment. This um, period of time is January 1 through March 31st of every year, and then based on your election, your coverage will start on July 1. So this applies to people really who've had a gap of coverage and when they realize it, and we run into this actually more often, I would say, with prescription coverage than we do with um, with medical coverage. But in this situation, um, you, you cannot sign up until the general enrollment period, even if you realize that you need it, you know, and uh, in October, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to sign up for it until January, and you're not going to be able to get it till July. And it's going to trigger a late enrollment penalty in most circumstances. 
Okay, that takes care of enrollment periods. Now we're moving on to um, the Medicare, the Medicare uh, supplements. So we talked about Medicare Part A and Part B. They have deductibles. They have copayments. Um, they have coinsurance. You could end up if you just have original Medicare without any other coverage, you can end up with some significant out-of-pocket costs. That's why many people purchase what's known as a Medicare supplement plan or a Medigap um, insurance. It is a private insurance plan that's designed to wrap around and supplement the original Medicare coverage. It helps pay some of the health care costs that original Medicare doesn't cover, such as deductibles, copayments, and coinsurance. If you have original Medicare plus the Medigap policy, Medicare is going to pay its share of the Medicare approved amounts first, and then your Medigap policy is going to pay its share. But in order to have that Medigap policy, you must be enrolled in both Part A and Part B Medicare. So um, Medigap policies, one thing that's really nice is it's sort of controlled by it is. It's it's um, supplemental to Medicare. Medicare calls the shots in terms of what's covered and who's covered. So as long as the doctor or the hospital where you're receiving treatment is contracted and accepts Medicare, then you can go there. Anywhere in the country, there's no limited network. Um, referrals are not needed. And um, there's no like list of network providers to say, oh, you know, this plan is only good in Massachusetts. It's really for national coverage. Um, so a little bit different than the Medicare Advantage plans that we're going to talk about shortly. In Massachusetts, there are only two approved versions of the Medigap plans. One is called the core plan and the other is supplemental one plan. The most significant difference in the plans is that the core plan does not cover um, all of the deductibles and the supplemental one plan does. So, um, you know, an interesting, uh, you know, way to add to your original coverage in Massachusetts, this is actually the most common way that people supplement their, um, their Medicare coverage, but not the only way, as we'll find out. And um, even with Part A and Part B and your Medigap coverage, you don't have coverage for prescriptions, so you do need to sign up for a Part D Medicare prescription drug plan. So Part D plans are available for all people who are enrolled. All, you need to be enrolled in Part A. Um, you don't need to be enrolled in Part B, um, but most people are. You don't need to have a Medigap policy, but most people do. Part D is for outpatient prescription drug um, coverage, and they can be purchased as a standalone benefit um, if you have original Medicare. Also, as you'll see, Part D plans can be wrapped and bundled into a Medicare Advantage plan. As far as what's covered under Part D plans, if any of you are already on Medicare um, and you have a Part D plan, you know that they're probably not like any other insurance that you've ever had before. They're a little bit complicated. So um, the, the government sort of calls the shots the, under the Medicare Modernization Act of, in terms of what the plans need to look like, what's covered, how it's covered. Um, and then there's variability for the, the um, prescription drug companies that choose to participate and get approved by Medicare to offer their plans. So Part D plans are not government plans, they are private plans. The cost um, for your coverage is going to depend on the plan that you choose, um, where you live, which drugs you use, whether you um, go to the pharmacy in your neighborhood or you use mail order or whether you qualify for extra help. Most people are going to pay a monthly premium for their prescription plan um, unless they qualify for special help. And that premium is in addition to the plan's deductible and cost sharing. The government uh, sets the maximum deductible for each year. And in 2017, it was uh, I think $405. So the plans that are offered in the state of Massachusetts range, some plans don't have any deductible, uh, some have $150, some $250, but it can't go higher than whatever the federal government sets for the maximum. And that max that deductible uh, amount will, again, change in 2018 so that companies can offer higher deductibles. Once the deductible is met on your plan, if you have one, 
then you're then you're going to either have a copayment or coinsurance that you will pay for um, your prescriptions, depending on whether they're generic, whether they're preferred, or maybe they're non-preferred um, brand name drugs. And um, you can use the Medicare website to shop for drug plans and see what plan is going to be best for you based on the overall cost, the premium plus the copayments that you might pay for the um, medications that you actually take. If you have a lot of prescription expenses during the year, you're going to find that you will enter into what's known as the coverage gap in the Part D plan. This is the point reach when the total cost of the covered drugs that you take reaches a dollar limit. That dollar limit in 2017 was set at $3,700. <clears throat> Once you're in the coverage gap, you're going to have to pay a percentage of your brand and generic drugs. And when the Part D plans were first offered back in 2006, if you ended up in this coverage gap or what was known as the donut hole, you were paying 100% of your brand name drug costs during that period. But as part of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act when that was passed, they wanted to, sh uh, to shrink that coverage gap. And so every year, the pharmaceutical companies are required to pay a higher percentage of the cost of the drugs that are in the coverage gap. So during 2017, um, if you were in the coverage gap and you needed a brand name drug, then you would pay 40% of the cost of it. The, the uh, pharmaceutical company would be picking up those 60%. And if you're taking a generic, you'd be paying 51% with the pharmaceutical company paying 49%. That amount will shrink again in 2018. So as you're progressing along, the coverage gap and you're paying these costs, they, they're still, the plan is still looking at how much you are spending on prescription drugs. So once you have actually paid cash out of pocket, a, a, a limit in um, 2017 of $4,950, you go into what's known as catastrophic coverage where the copayments that, you, um, that you're responsible for are going to become very small for the remainder of the year. So you start out with good coverage under a health plan. Let's say, well, maybe you have a deductible, you have co-pays. Then if you get into the coverage gap, you're going to be paying a lot more of the cost of your medications. Then if you progress to the catastrophic level, your costs are again going to go down lower than they were even at the beginning of the year. <clears throat> I hope that made sense, but I'm always available to explain to you if you have specific questions. So things to consider when you're looking at a Part D plan. Um, first of all, I mentioned that each plan does have a formulary, which is a list of covered drugs. And you want to make sure if you're taking a lot of medications that the drugs that you take are um, not only in the plan's formulary, but that they're a reasonable copayment. So the formulary in each plan has to have a range of drugs um, for the most commonly prescribed categories to make sure that people with different medical conditions can get the treatment that they need. All Medicare drug plans generally must cover at least two drugs in each category of drugs, but plans can choose which two drugs um, that they cover. So we say we're looking at cholesterol-reducing drugs. They have to have at least two drugs, but they might not be, you know, plan A might not have the same two drugs as plan B. So that's where your research comes in. There are also certain protected treatments where all drugs must be included, such as for treatment of cancer, um, for HIV, antipsychotic and immunosuppressant medications, um, for um, I'm drawing a blank on, on those diseases, but that's beside the point. Anyway, um, if you are someone who is going through treatment, all drug plans have to cover um, those treatments for you. So. Um, you may be uh, subject to a penalty if you don't enroll for Part D in your initial enrollment period, and the penalty is assessed for every month that you delay um, signing up. So you may have to pay more for your Part D if you're late, and also you have to pay more if you fall into one of those higher income brackets that we saw with the Part B premiums. Since um, plan costs and formularies do change from year to year, it's a good idea to review your Part D um, frequently. So if, you know, if your medications change, if you get notice that a certain drug that you've been taking 
um, is going to a higher copayment, all these things sort of shout out to say, hey, maybe I should look and see if there's a better fit for me in, in the next year. There are special enrollment periods that apply for Part D, and this is mostly important to just um, keep track of, like, for example, we had a, a call from a client this week who's changing um, their permanent residence from Massachusetts to Florida. That would trigger what's known as a special enrollment period. Um, they don't need to do anything before they get to Florida, but once they get to Florida, there is a two-month special enrollment period to sign up for a new coverage. So just knowing that certain things are going to, when the basically when the plan's not going to work for you anymore, that's going to trigger a special enrollment period that you um, have to act fairly promptly to make sure that you um, get the proper coverage. So now we're up to Medicare Advantage plans. We've mentioned before that um, in a, uh, some cir circumstances, you might want to exchange your Part A and Part B original Medicare and, and instead sign up with an insurance plan um, that manages your total health care under a Medicare Advantage plan. These are private insurance companies that are approved by Medicare to provide your coverage. You, um, you will need to use the plan's network of doctors, so it's not any Medicare provider, it's anyone within the health plan's network that's allowed. Some of the Medicare Advantage plans are like HMOs, and that means that you're going to have to re obtain referrals, um, have a primary care physician, and stay within the network. Um, these plans are good for people who don't have more than one residence, but might not be the best choice if you like to spend a few months as a snowbird um, in other parts of the country. There are also PPO plans um, where you can receive treatment um, within the network, but also outside of the network, but generally you're going to have to pay more out-of-pocket costs for such advantage. Um, one thing to notice is that you uh, note on this is that you cannot have both a Medigap plan and a Medicare Advantage plan, so it's one or the other. You can enroll in your Medi in a Medicare Advantage plan during this upcoming open enrollment. Um, you can also enroll for Medicare Advantage um, due to your initial enrollment period due to a disability. And then there are triggers also, as I mentioned for the Part D plans, there are triggers for when you can enroll or change your Medicare Advantage plan. So if you move out of the plan service area, um, if you go in or out of a long-term care facility, um, if you qualify for extra help, if you um, want to choose a plan that has a five-star rating that gives you a, a continuous open enrollment for the best, best Medicare Advantage plans, you can join any time during the year. Um, so there are, there are special circumstances when you can join or change your Medicare Advantage. You can go on to um, Medicare.gov to look for both drug plans and health plans, and you can personalize your search. And um, this is a great website that I often use um, to help our clients look at plans. But I also want to say that you should consider Sylvia Group as your trusted advisor. We are licensed. We're certified for Medicare products. We can help you compare plans based on your personal health care needs where you live, where you hibernate or spend your winters, um, what your criteria are in terms of star ratings, premium costs, et cetera. We also help people who are transitioning from full-time employment um, so that you have a seamless transition and avoid any late enrollment penalties for Medicare. Um, we help when you're looking at losing your dental insurance or vision insurance or life insurance because you're retiring. What happens to those coverages? Should I should I go with uh, COBRA? Are there other options? And um, what is your plan for protecting your savings from a catastrophic event or a long-term illness? These are all things that we can help you with and talk to you about as your independent brokers representing several companies and never just one. So that's it, um, Vin. If you are available and you want to um, wrap up the meeting. I'm available. Uh, thank you, Julie. That was a great job as always. And thank you to all our attendees today. Uh, before wrapping up, I 
just like to mention an upcoming Sylvia Group Education Series event that may be of interest. On Thursday, November 16, we'll be hosting a seminar entitled, Who Needs Long-Term Care Insurance at Our Office in Dartmouth? The seminar will run from 5.30 until 7 p.m. It will include light refreshments before the presentation and a question and answer session at the end. You'll be able to find more information on our website or by contacting me at vsylvia at sylviagroup.com. We're pretty close to the end of our time here. Um, so we're going to wrap up soon. If you have any questions, I'm going to keep the uh, keep the site up and you can post those and we can get back to you by email or you can contact Julie directly at the information at the contact you see on the screen either by phone or by email. So again, thank you all for your time. I hope you have a great day. I'm sure you found this useful and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you.